so good to see you, so good to have you. If it's your first time here, we want to say welcome, welcome, welcome. If you'd like, you can fill out a connection card. We'd love to connect with you in any way right in your pew. You can fill that out, and we'd love to connect with you. We've got Youth Sunday. Our teenagers are bringing release. You all know the drill. Give it up for Kenley and Sophia back there and all the teens. So good, so good. Everyone say November 10th. November 10th, we're having a potluck and baptism. If you'd like to get baptized, uh, that would be a great opportunity. Where It's going to be a potluck November 10th, second Sunday in November, obviously. We're going to have a service here. It's going to be a shortened service. And then afterwards, we're going to go over to Legend Lake. Come on, somebody. It's a beautiful neighborhood, just not even five minutes from here, Mike and Renee's house, and uh, it's going to be a great time. If you'd like, you can sign up at the connection table, bring a side dish, and it's just a fun time. We've got a bounce house for the kids, pool, and a fun time. And last announcement I have, it's not really an announcement, more like a recap. This weekend, as you know, we had the His Church Conference. Amazing, amazing, amazing time. Powerful. Uh, it's powerful because it's not just something that we're doing. It's not just something we found on a website. I got to talk for a second. You got to hear this because this is so big for us. I want you to understand this. It's not just a conference that we saw on a website and we were like, wow, we need something to do. So we tried to do it. It's based out of what we would call divine relationships. Uh, that's relationships that we know that we are connected to for life. And so how many of you know if you know something's going to be long term, you might invest more into it if you know it's going to last forever. And so these relationships with the people involved with the conference are really lifelong relationships that Joanne and I have had and that we look to for um, for leadership and all of that. And so a team from Oklahoma came down to do VBS. They did a great job pouring into the kids. And also the leadership of our apostolic family came down. And one of those people who serves on, on the council that we look to for leadership is a gentleman by the name of Kendrick Oakley. Uh, he's a powerful man of God. He's my friend. I am so proud to say he's my friend. He and his wife, Elizabeth, have four boys. They planted a church called Real Life in Oklahoma. They pastored that church for many years. And he is a spiritual son of Glenn Shaford. And uh, through, you know, just through prayer, they merged those works together. So his church and Destiny Life merged. We know a little bit about a merger. And um, anyways, uh, that's, that's just a little bit about him. And he's a man of God. He's a friend. He's powerful. He's godly. He's a good man. And he's going to minister today. So would you all give it up for Pastor Kendrick Oakley in the house today? I love you. I'll cash up you for all that you said. You said that was 50. Is just, no, just, good morning. It is good to be together and it has been a tremendous time. We have a team of 17 that came, and eight of those are 18 and, and under um, that pulled their own funds to come and be a part and to pour out their life. And so it's just been a blessing, as Dan was articulating. It's different when it's family. I'm not, I'm not interested in transactional ministry. I want to I want to live life together. I want to be family together and build together. And we have the privilege of of being here at least once a year in this area uh, doing this East Coast conference and hanging out with Life Spring and so I was honored uh, to be invited to to come back and and spend some time here with you guys. I love Life Spring. I love who you are. I love the mission of this house, the purpose of this house. I absolutely love your leaders. Dan and Joanna, and, um, and just honored to be in relationship, in covenant relationship, and to be able to do this, uh, this thing called extending the kingdom in the earth together. And um, yeah, so he did a great job. I feel like we can just dive directly into some content. There's some things that have been stirring on my heart. There's, there's a burden that has been on my heart for the body of Christ. I could weep even now um, for the church and our nation. And I feel like Jesus is just speaking to us. And so I want to just release a prophetic burden today um, and really draw us back to 
the simplicity of being madly in love with Jesus and, and the simplicity of prayer, the power of prayer, my heart would be that there would be just a fresh stir in the house and a fresh activation in the house. So let's pray. Father, we just thank you for who you are, your King and your Lord and your worthy. And we set our gaze upon you this morning. Nothing else matters. We, we gather for you. We, we long to see you. We long to encounter you. We long to know you. And Father, we don't desire to go through religious motions, but Lord, we want to leave having encountered you and something on the inside of us shifted. We want to we want to leave this room more in love with you than when we came. And, and you can do that through the power of your word. It's alive and it's active. But Holy Spirit, we need your help today. We pray that you would speak and that you would bring truth and that you would unveil truth, that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to understand. And that by your spirit, there will be an activation amongst us as individuals and corporately as a body. And we give your name, honor and praise in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So we're just going to go directly into the deep end. Is that okay? Um, I really feel like the Lord has us in a time of simplifying and stripping and um, he's, he's stripping some things in order for his purpose to come forth. And I believe that's happening on an individual level. The interesting thing about times of stripping is it can feel like it's the devil when God is at work. And I think it's happening on an individual level. I believe it's happening on corporate levels. Um, it looks like it's even happening on a national level. But when we do not build right, we build on things that eventually the Lord has to tear down. And this is, I see this in, in Paul's words when he is writing to the church of Corinth. And he says something very interesting in chapter two. He said, when I came to you, I came and I withheld and, and I decided to know nothing. I didn't come in lofty words of man's wisdom, but I came knowing nothing besides Christ and him crucified. I made the deliberate decision to withhold from you. Uh, to withhold wisdom, to withhold charisma and personality. And he says, so that your faith may not rest on the wisdom of man, on the charisma of man, on the personality of man, on the teaching style of man, but that your faith would rest on the power of God. And so him saying that and him deliberately building in that way reveals that it's a possibility um, to build our faith on the wrong thing without realizing it. And it reminds me of a picture that I have in my head. We have four sons, amen. So we're always accepting applications for intercessors, amen. You can every day at three o'clock just lift us up. <laughs> we have four sons and it's so fun. We, we, we like to ride bikes and, and our youngest, when he was still on training wheels, would ride and we're riding bikes and he's riding something completely different. You look in his face, he's riding a Batmobile, a jet ski. I mean, he's riding that thing. He's killing that thing. And my wife love, we love just looking at him and watching him. But one time I made my way from his face down to his feet and up top, he is riding that Batmobile. But down low, I began to laugh because one of the training wheels was completely lifted 100% off of the ground. He had no idea. And when you strip those training wheels, all of a sudden he began to realize that my weight has been leaning. I've been leaning on certain things. And I believe it's a prophetic picture of where the body of Christ is in this hour in the West. And Revelation chapter two, verse four, Jesus is talking to the church of Ephesus and he says a lot of great things. I love your toil your labor, your perseverance, that you stand against false apostles. He says, but I have this one thing against you. He says that you have abandoned the love you had at first. So I, I believe that we're in this season of stripping and simplification because we've made this more complicated than what it really is. You, you look in the book of Acts and it was, it was simple. It was a group of people who were madly in love with Jesus. And what I've come to realize is that whenever what we are doing for him pulls us from him, it's out of order. And, and I'm wondering if through the last few generations in the West, if what we're doing for him has actually pulled us from him. And there's things that he needs to 
get in order. There's things that he needs to realign. I believe that there's been this war with two words that begin with A. It's attending and abiding. We, we have taught people for generations how to attend, but we have failed to teach generations how to abide. That's the point of all of this. The goal is not to attend something. The goal is to learn how to abide in someone. And all of our attending of something should serve the purpose of learning how to abide in someone. But I believe we've leaned so far over here that we have a generation that does not know how to live in him when they leave the building, when they leave the group, when they leave. They, we don't know how to live in him and abide in him and walk with him. And we have to get back to this place. And so as we talk a little bit about prayer and becoming a house of prayer, becoming a people of prayer, uh, our homes, we don't have time to lean into that, but, but I'm convinced that Nothing is sustained until it hits the home. It doesn't matter what happens at this altar. The fire of God can fall and we can be slain. But if the home does not shift, if things do not be imp get implemented into the home, then nothing is actually being extended. So our homes have to become places of prayer. We have to raise our children in an environment beyond teaching, in an environment where they have testimonies in their 30s of, I remember when we almost did not make it, but mommy began to pray. Come on, somebody. I, I remember when there was challenges. I know what my dad would do. He would get on his face before God. We have to, we have to raise a generation to learn the power of prayer. Many of us in this room are 30, 40, 50, and we still aren't convinced of the power of prayer. What would happen if our children are convinced before they get out of the house? And so there's a draw and there's a pull. But before we talk about becoming a house of prayer, let's take a moment and look at the center of God's heart. Because beyond this local house, beyond DLC, being a house of prayer, prayer is at the very foundation of what it means to be God's people. The question is, what sets us apart from every other people group in the earth? And when you think about it, there's not much. <laughs> We, we don't have much to offer apart from the Holy Spirit. What sets us apart from every other people group in the earth is the simple fact that we've been reconciled in covenant relationship with the creator of the universe. It's, it's the only, apart from that, we have nothing to offer besides flesh. But the Holy Spirit, what sets us apart, we're in relationship with him. We, we commune with him. He dwells in us. He dwells amongst us. He hears our voice and, and we hear his voice and, and we're in relationship. And I want us to see for a moment because when we just forget all of that and just step into we need to pray, we miss the heart of God that actually empowers us to pray. But, but if we look at the, the, the heart of God's plan, at the very heart of his grand design is his desire for relationship. From the very dawn of creation, God's central purpose has been to dwell among his people, to have personal, intimate communion. We go all the way back to the garden. He creates man and woman in his image, and you immediately see the uniqueness of this relationship. He did not birth an enterprise. He did not birth a business. He could have ran it that way. But instead, we see this image of family that he's walking with them in the cool of the day. He's partnering with them to the extent that the creator of the universe is bringing his creation before Adam and saying, whatever you want to call it, that's what it's going to be called. What? What is this partnership? What is this relationship? And I want us to see that it's always been his plan throughout all of history, and it will be the case throughout all of eternity. It's easy to look back at the old covenant and be like, oh my good, thank God for Jesus. He was just mean back then. He was just all them goats and bloods and festivals. And it's easy to look at that. It's almost like God was, was bringing restrictions on his people. But I want us to look through a, a fresh lens today. What I'm talking about is the sacrificial system, the tabernacle, the temple, the festivals. I want us in this moment to see them not as restrictions, but as an extension of his, of his grace and his love and his mercy. I want us to see them as even in the midst of rebellion, idolatry and depravity, the way Jesus, the way was on the way. But the father said, I'm not going to wait for that. Way. I'm going to make means for us to be together right now. He didn't have to do that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to create ways for us to dwell together, to be together. 
The sacrificial system. Let's see it as a means for there to be continuous relational reconciliation. Wow. They're, 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 they're wandering in the wilderness. And you look at Exodus 13 and it says, and the Lord went before them by day in a pillar and, 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 and by night a pillar of, of fire that he's with them. And it says, and this did not depart from before the people. Now, he was always with them, but, but look how he's going out of his way tangibly in the physical realm to, to let them know that I am with you. I am amongst you. I am dwelling with you. The festivals, they, they served as rhythms of worship and devotion designed to maintain and deepen their relationship with God. We have the tabernacle. Exodus 25 is, is going to be on the screen for you right there. Let's look at this. It says, and let them make me a sanctuary. Why? It's, it's very simple. That I may dwell in their midst. It's his heart. It's always been his heart. Eventually, they, they formed this tabernacle that formed a more permanent place for him to dwell amongst his people. And so as we are talking about becoming families of prayer, becoming a house of prayer, um, there's a few components that I believe are significant and necessary for us to grow into, to embrace, and to live out together. We're going to look at a few things. Let's look at prayer vision. Let's look at something called prayer dependency. We're going to look at something called um, prayer faith. And then if we have a little bit of time, we're going to look at something called uh, prayer in the terms of, of generationally focused. And so everybody say vision. Dan had mentioned that we launched Real Life at, at, in 2012. And, and the first word the Lord gave us concerning that group of people was that it shall be a house of worship, a house of prayer, and a house of revival. And that became very significant for us because then you just have to build. And as you're building, there's a, there's, in, a, in a sense, there's this machine that has to run, right? There's, there's, there's ministry, there's organization, there's leadership, there's, there's administration, there's all those things that are necessary. But we found ourselves so often drifting so far into those things that we were drifting away from the main thing. And so the Lord used that word that it shall be a house of worship, a house of prayer, a house of revival to constantly bring us back to that focus, to bring us back to that core call of what it means to be the people of God in a particular place. We're talking about prayer vision. It begins with us aligning our heart to the vision that he has for his people, the vision that he has for his house. And it reminds me of, of Jesus in Matthew. Um, this isn't in the, on the screen for you, but let me read it. Matthew 21, 12. You guys know it. It says, and Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of robbers. Now, there's many things that we can point out. The first thing, notice that there was a driving out before he brought something in. And this is correlating with this theme prophetically that I'm sensing in this season of a stripping away. Um, that, that the Lord had to clear the house from that which was not important. Um, think of it like this. This, to me, was a physical example of him rearranging the priorities of his people, of him rearranging the priorities of his house. And he, and he quotes from Isaiah. And, and, and the way that I see this is Jesus is the Son of God. The Word declares that he was the direct imprint of God the icon of the father. And here he is coming into his father's house and he's burdened and he's flipping the tables over and he declares, it shall be. And we can feel, he could have said anything in that moment. This is the son of God coming on behalf of the father and he's saying, it shall be. And he could fill in the blank. It could have been anything. And yet his declaration as he declared from the Father's heart, is it shall be a house of prayer. It says for all people, for all nations. That, that doesn't just mean that we come in and we pray for the nations. It means that Jesus is saying, you guys don't understand, I left my throne for this. That my blood would be shed, that it would break every dividing wall, and that this would be a house of prayer for every pe people, every nation, every group, every tongue, every language. 
And, he, and he's quoting out of Isaiah, 50, uh, Isaiah 56, 7. It says, these I will bring to my holy mountain and I will make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar for my house shall be, shall be called a house of prayer for all people. Now on January 1st, 2020, if you can remember that, that was a different world. That was before the world changed. Amen. It was before our nation changed. January 1st, 2020. And we gathered in Tulsa at the Tulsa House of Prayer. And we had prophets fly in because we wanted to hear not just what the Lord was saying over that year, but we were stepping into a new decade. So we wanted to hear what is the Lord saying over this decade. And I had the privilege of speaking that January 1st and the Lord gave me a word that I believe is a decade long word and it won't leave me alone. He said, I'm getting ready to declutter my church that Christ may become visible again. Amen. That what is most important to me will once again become what's most important to you. It began to break me to realize that people are capable in the West of coming in and out of our buildings and never finding Jesus. If you could picture his house as a house with rooms, we got rooms for events and rooms for groups and rooms. And, and I believe God is raising up a people group that's in the house saying, where's the room where we can just be with him? Where's the room where we just seek him and we encounter him? Because people are able to come in and out of the houses that we're building and, and, and completely. So he said, I'm decluttering my church that Christ may become visible again. And the question is, is what's most important to him truly what's most important to us? Or have we rearranged his priorities? And then that brings me to the question of do we truly trust the way that he intends to extend his kingdom and build his church? The early church did not have anything that we have. They didn't have, they didn't have electricity. Could you imagine? And they have the band and the screens. We're spoiled. Two screens is not enough. It's not big enough. Right? They didn't, they didn't have anything that we had, and yet they flipped the world upside down. Silver and gold we have not, but somebody say, but what we do have. <laughs> Man, what we do have. And I feel like we've made an exchange, and now we've rearranged that to say, Healing we do not have, but we have silver and gold. We have facilities. I just feel like the, the Lord is at work. We have to get vision of what he sees for his house and then be willing to strip, be, be willing to allow him to bring us back to that purpose. And, and, I, and I want us to see for a moment that this is not a new call. This is not something God is looking down like, oh my goodness, look at the state of this nation. We need prayer. No, no, no. It's always been his heart for the people. It's always been at the center of his heart. We can go all the way back to 2 Chronicles 7. You guys know it. And this is on the screen. It says, thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord and the king's house. All that Solomon had planned to do in the house of the Lord and on his own house, he successfully accomplished. Verse 12, then the Lord appeared to Solomon in the night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and I've chosen this place as a place of sacrifice. He says, basically, let me summarize 13. When I shut up the heavens and, and things happen in the land, verse 14, if my people who are called by my name, Humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Now that word if is very important. This is an if then statement. And they hear from heaven. Then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now I want us to see out of this passage that prayer is not just to be a religious routine, but, but he's saying my people have a specific role in the earth. I want you to be attentive to times and seasons. I want you to be aware of how I'm moving in the earth and I want you to partner in conjunction with me. I want you to be sensitive to times. I want you to partner with the activity. And when you see certain things happening in the land, I needed to be a cue for my people to respond. And here's four things that I need you to do. Let's pull those up on the screen. He says, I need, I need humility. I'm calling you to prayer. I'm calling you to seek my face. Those two things are not one and the same because there's an and there separating them. We don't have time to talk about seeking the face of Jesus. There's a whole other topic that we've lost our ability to, to seek the face of Jesus individually, and corporately. And then he said to repent. I believe that these are the four most important things the body of Christ can be doing in this nation right now. 
And yet I feel like it's the four most neglected. In my heart and my prayers, Lord, resurrect these in our hearts. Now, everybody say dependency. It's on the screen. We, we talked a little bit about, about prayer vision. Let's talk about prayer dependency. This is so important. Everything that God desires to do from this day forth into the next 40 years and beyond must be birthed from the place of prayer. Methods are not going to work. Strategy is not going to work. Marketing is not going to work. He's bringing us back to the call and the place of prayer. As I was praying about the generational transition that, that the earth is in, that the body of Christ is in, I was praying specifically over DLC, but I recognized that the word extended beyond that. The Lord said this at the end of 2023. Speaking of the younger generation, he said, no longer will they ask, how did they do this? But they will come to me and ask, Lord, how do you want us to do this? That's a very simple word, but it's very deep. What it means is that the Lord is going to have to bring a new generation into a place of total dependency, of learning how to depend on him again. Everybody say dependency. dependency. Yeah, dependency is at the very foundation of effective prayer individually and corporately. I believe the root of prayerlessness is not busyness. Let me say that again. The root of prayerlessness is not busyness. I begin to recognize that when I recognize that I've never heard someone come up to me and say, I've been so busy, I haven't eaten in three months. I've never heard it. I've never heard someone say, I've been so busy, I haven't been able to eat in three weeks. Like no matter how busy we are, we rarely miss a meal. As long as we think the thing blocking us from a stronger prayer life is our schedule, we will be stuck. The issue is not our schedule, it's our heart, and our schedule is a reflection of our heart. Our schedule doesn't form our priorities, it reflects it. When we are truly dependent upon Him, like no matter how busy you are, you eat because you recognize that without it I can't live. But my word says that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. My question is, what, is, what has the church been depending on? Let's, let's be honest just for a moment. Because if, if we have time to eat every meal, but we don't have enough time to pray, then we genuinely think we need food more than him. Is that, is that just honest? Because when you are dependent upon him, the busier you are, the more you pray. Are, are you kidding me? I barely survived the last season. Come on, somebody. If I needed you then, if things are picking up, when God has really anchored your heart in dependency, busyness does not strip you from prayer. It calls you into it more because you recognize that you are sustained by his grace. And the Lord challenged me in this. In my ORU days, because my first year at ORU, at 20 years old, a church fell in our hands. I never wanted to pastor. And here, he's making me do it at 20. It sounds like how he moves. Amen. And, and I'm carrying this weight, and I have papers, and I'm, a, I'm alone. We don't have a team of elders. Like, we're just starting, and, and we're reforming this work. And I have papers due, and I'm preaching every week, and I'm doing the Bible studies. And, and he challenged me in that season, and it, began, it became a milestone in my life. Because honestly, Lord, there's no time to pray. And he said, I want to challenge you. I, I want you to take this hour to pray. I want you to take this hour to pray. And what began to happen is I began to recognize that out of obedience, because prayer is anchored in dependency, it's saying, I cannot do this without you. For us to go through the day without pray, somehow along the way, we started to think that we can do this without him. And so I began to recognize that when I gave him an hour of prayer, something supernatural began to work. I was able to accomplish in an hour what should have taken me five. This is what it means to depend on him. If you flip that around, you say, I don't have time for that. You're saying, Lord, I'm just going to try to do this on my own strength. But there's a spiritual principle to say, I do not have time. And that's why I need to pray. I'm going to honor you. I'm going to surrender this. And something supernatural is going to empower me to do that which he's called me to do. 
I believe he's having to bring a, a new generation back to a place of total dependency. Here's the hard part. That's going to require us to discover how much we need him. Here's why it's hard. That's going to require hard times and challenges and pain and discomfort because we never become aware of our need on the mountaintops. The valley is necessary for this purpose, bringing us to a place of dependency. I give, I I resist the proud, but I give grace to the humble. The, the, The root of prayerlessness is not busyness. The root of prayerlessness, are you ready? Is self sufficiency. I think that I can do this without you. So here's this formula on the screen. Let's, let's pull up that next one. Prayer really is an awareness of need, a longing for intimacy, and an anticipation of divine intervention. If you're taking notes, we don't have time. If you're taking notes, just write down Revelation chapter 3, verse 14, and read that because it's very similar to where we are as he's, he's talking to the, the church in that. But let, let's move to this, this next session just for a moment due to time. Everyone say faith. We've talked about prayer vision. We've talked about prayer dependency. Let's take a moment and let's talk about prayer faith because we must understand the place that God has given to prayer from his sovereignty, from his providence. You and I do not decide the place of prayer. You and I do not decide the power of prayer. He does. And your prayer life I believe, is a reflection of your current level of understanding of prayer. The more you understand the power of prayer, the more you will pray. The more you understand what is happening when you open up your mouth as a believer, the more you'll exercise it. So the Lord has to help us in this. It's very hard to truly understand the power of prayer and not utilize it. It's like being gifted a Lamborghini and your garage and yet day after day, you getting on that bicycle through the, through the snow and the mountains and the valleys and riding your way, striving and struggling, not realizing that there's this vehicle of empowerment that has the ability to take you from here to there. And yet that is what we look like in the realm of the spirit, riding that bike again in our own strength. And God is saying, I have a vehicle for that. But we have to be awakened to the power of prayer. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy burdened, I will give you rest. But notice the first thing he said, come to me. By faith, come to me. So God desires to not just teach us how to pray, but he desires to reveal to us the power of prayer. Last year, October, this time, the Lord started this conversation with me. I was in France and he said, I want to take you on a journey of teaching you the power of prayer. See, the thing about learning the power of prayer is you're not going to learn it from me talking to you today. You you can't learn the power of prayer by reading a book. All those tools can supplement, but you will only learn the power of prayer by stepping out in faith in your own life and saying, God, would you show me the power that you have placed in this thing called prayer? Let's let's just be encouraged by the scripture. If it's okay, let's go through a series of scripture. Let's look at this just for a moment. Let's begin in James 5. James 5, 16 The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. That's very important. And he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again and heaven gave rain and the earth bore its fruit. Now, I love how he's writing this. Notice what he's pointing out. He said, I need you to know there was nothing special about Elijah. He was a man with a nature just like ours. The power was not in Elijah. He's saying, here's what set him apart. He prayed fervently. His nature was the same, but he's highlighting the power is in prayer. And you have access to the same prayer that Elijah had access to. And he prayed fervently and by faith. And there was a divine response. Somebody say prayer. Exodus 32, 11 through 14, but Moses implored the Lord his God and said, oh God, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt and great power and might in your hand? And the Lord relented from the disaster that he had spoken of bringing upon his people. I don't know about you. When I read that, I say, I want to walk with you in that way. I want to be an intercessor because you reveal your heart to intercessors. Prayer becomes a safe place for God to reveal his heart. 
One of the issues is, is we're so carried and caught up with, with, with pouring our heart upon him that we have neglected saying, God, what is on your heart? Give us your heart. And prayer becomes that place. Acts 4, 29 through 39. And now this is when persecution first hit the early church. They knew what to do. They didn't have the electricity. They didn't have social media. They didn't have picketing. They didn't have right. They knew what to do. And they, they, they gathered together. They began to pray and said, now look, Lord, look upon their threats. And grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal. And signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, come on, let's say that together. And when they had prayed, wow, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And what? And continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Now, I don't know all the details. I wasn't there. But here's what I knew, that they gathered together and they began to pray and God responded. He responded. He, he, he didn't have to shake the room. But he, but he did that just, I believe, in the early church to let them know the power of this vehicle, the power of this instrument, that when my people lift their voices, I hear from heaven and I respond. Acts 12, 5 through 7. Oh, I love this one. So Peter was kept in prison. Uh-oh. But earnest prayer. Somebody say earnest. earnest. We're not talking about stoplight prayers. Come on, somebody. <laughs> we ain't talking about Lord be with me. Oh, it's green. Amen. We're not talking about that. Somebody say earnest. Earnest. Earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Now, when Herod was about to bring him on that out that evening, that very night, Peter, somebody say that very night, that very night. my Lord, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, centuries before the doors were guarding the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him and a light shone in the cell and he struck Peter on the side and woke him up saying, get up quickly. And the chains fell off. This was because while he was locked up, the church knew what to do, that we're going to make earnest prayer until there's breakthrough. They were not in the prison with Peter. They were way over here, but something supernatural happened in the realm of the spirit that an angel received an assignment and showed up in the prison and supernaturally broke him out and he goes and knocks on the door and and they're praying and the, and the answer has arrived and they can't even believe it somebody say prayer let's let's look at this last one real quick real quick revelation 8 3 through 5 mm. and another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer and he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and threw it on the earth. And there was pills of thunder and rumbling and flashings of lightning. Wow. That, that's Revelation 8. Now, let me go back to Revelation 5 for a moment. In verse 8 it says, And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell before the Lamb. Look at this. Each holding a harp in golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. I need you to know that's not, that's not going to happen someday. I don't know how valuable you think your prayers are, but the very fact that the prayers of the saints are represented as being in golden bowls before the Lamb of God indicates that these prayers are precious and valuable in the heavenly realm. As we pray... Let me end with this. Let me, let me, let's pull that, that image up on the screen. And here's where I want to challenge you. Imagine this as fears. And, and, and maybe this first fear right here is, is you're just praying to make it through Tuesday. Keep praying to make it through Tuesday. But I want to challenge you today that the Lord wants to expand the sphere of your prayer life. 
And maybe right now all you do is you have the strength to pray for yourself. And let me debunk a religious lie that says we shouldn't pray for ourselves. That's a lie. I need, are you kidding me? I need Jesus. Are you kidding me? Don't pray for myself. I need G. I know Kendra Oakley. I'm constantly praying for myself to what? To be conformed into your image. Prayers of consecration. Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you. I need your strength. I need your grace. I need your wisdom. But the Lord desires to expand us beyond that. What if happened? What, what happens if, if we begin to really pray for our homes? I'm not talking about stoplight prayers. I'm talking about mommies waking up in the middle of the night and praying over their children, declaring the word of God over the what if husbands and fathers woke up in the morning and said, Lord, I'm gonna dedicate time to you. And I'm going to pray over my home and I'm going to break things off of my family. See, if you are a parent and you've never hit up against something in the realm of the spirit. There's a war going on in the spirit. We should regularly be hitting up against something. Like, what is that? And we're able to break through for the generations. What would have happened if, if married couples begin to pray again? Here, here we are trying to change the world. And I'm saying, what? We need to come back to the basics. Couples aren't praying together. Come on. And what, what if we extended that and we began to really pray for our cities? Oh, what would happen, guys? We begin to lift our voices. We begin to pray. And I'm not just talking about when the pastor says in the church. I'm talking about in our lives, in our homes, we're praying over the schools. We're praying over the government. What if happened? We go to the next level. We begin to really pray over the nation. What I'm saying is the church is calling the church right now. Christ is calling his church to rearrange our priorities. Let's stand to our feet and let's pray just in this moment. Pull up that Romans 12, 12, and let's, let's read and declare this together. Romans 12, 12 should be the final scripture on there. Are you ready? Let's read this together. Rejoice in hope. Woo! Well, hold up now. Be patient in tribulation. Let's say it together. Be constant. Father, I thank you for this house called Life Spring. I thank you that you've called this and designed this to be a house of prayer. And I feel something very unique. I, I felt like the, the burden is usually over the corporate body, but I feel something very unique over homes for this house. And I believe that there's a, a fresh invitation and challenge to build altars in your homes and take the first step wherever you are to begin to pray and move in your home. So Father, I thank you for a fresh activation. Father, the intercessors in this house, I pray that you would revive them today. Whoever's grown weak or weary, we thank you that rivers of living water are flowing in the mighty name of Jesus. That life is coming to those dry places. But there's those in the room that have felt dry, even in their prayer life with you, Father. I thank you that today there's an activation and there's a fresh flow in the mighty name of the Lord. And I say to the intercessors in this house, arise. Arise with fresh strength and begin to pray and begin to intercede. Begin to pray over this house. Begin to pray over your leaders. I felt this and I'm just going to say it that there is a whole new dimension of praying over your leaders that must come to the house in this season. Because there's fresh realms of grace that the Lord wants to unlock for them. If you notice, when, when Peter was in prison, it was the church who was making earnest prayer. We have to be sensitive to times and seasons, but I believe this house is in a time and a season where earnest prayer needs to be lifted up over your leaders because God is doing something very special and very unique, and there is a grace that they're stepping into. In fact, stretch your hands out right now and just begin to pray over them. Let's activate this. Just begin to pray right there where you are. Begin to cover them. Begin to declare the goodness of the Lord. Begin to declare strength over them. In the mighty name of Jesus, we bless them. We thank you for fresh measures of grace opening up over Dan and over Joanne and over this family, oh God. We thank you for fresh measures of strength and vision and revelation, oh God. We bless you for who these leaders are and we thank you that right now you are activating something fresh in this house and you are raising up intercessors and you are forming this as a house of prayer. A house of worship, a house of revival. Activate the worship. Take them into deeper realms right now. May fresh grace rest upon you in the mighty name of Jesus. Let me give this last, this last word um, over the house as I was praying this morning. I just heard the Lord say that he is pleased with how this house has cared for his children. And I've not felt, I've not felt that 
as I've come into a, a local church, the way that I felt it, that he's pleased with how this house has cared for his children. Matthew 19, Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such of these. In Matthew 18, whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. And I, and I believe it's out of your care for children and out of your care for generations that it's gonna unlock something very special in the years to come. And, um, and that there's a fresh grace coming on the house for resources for children and family. Amen. And so Father, we just thank you for that fresh vision, fresh revelation. I don't know what all is going to form, but in the years to come, there's gonna be vision. There's gonna be vision. I don't know if there's a school, but there, there's something that your, your obedience now is for the, the real thing in the realm of the generations that he's calling you to in the years to come. And he's setting up, he's setting you guys up for it. So Father, we just thank you for the faithfulness of this house. We bless this house right now in the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Y'all stay standing, please. I want to pray. Would you bow your heads with me, Lord? The word that brought forth. The Lord that the word that was brought forth, Lord. A couple things. One for homes to pray. Lord, let us not just hear that. I, I tell you for myself, I wrote something down in my calendar, a shift that I hope and pray would happen for me. Don't let us just hear it. But Lord, I pray, let us do it. Let us do it. And there will be some in this place that, that do it. Let us be one of those, God, I pray. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. And Lord, I thank you for the word that the, the, the language that just came out that I thank you, Lord, that you are pleased with the way that we have taken care of children. What a privilege to hear that from the Lord. The Lord would say that he is pleased with the way that we have taken care of children. Father, thank you. Let that word be sealed. Let us hold it closely and so gently and so delicately. Father, we thank you for the word that was in this place. We give you glory. We give you honor, Jesus, for what you're doing in our midst. We love you today. In Jesus' name, amen.